Thanks, Tara, and thanks, Frank. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor uh, to speak with you today, uh, and thank you to the City Program for facilitating this. Uh, we're going to start with a slide that really sums up the key issues uh, of the topic today, and that is that patterns of access and use of transportation infrastructures and means of transports are deeply gendered. Of course, these are um, these uh, sort of inequities are uh, regionally specific. Issues look specific, um, place specific in, in different uh, areas of the world. But what we see the world over is that women's travel patterns are different from men's, and these differences are characterized by persistent inequality. Um, part of that, a central part of that, is. Uh, the gender role that is that uh, women are expected to do the majority of the care labor, the housework, the um, child labor, uh, picking kids up from daycare, that sort of thing, and that really has an impact on uh, women's mobility. So I want to start by um, sharing with you uh, my perspective in coming to this topic. Um, I'm a feminist geographer, as Tara said, and if your eyes go cross and you have a little um, wrinkle in your uh, forehead about what that means, that's usually the response that I get. Um, I usually tell people that I look at social justice in the city, how uh, people are differently affected by access to housing and access to resources, and how people respond to that. Um, what kinds of collaborative and creative changes and, and sort of forms of resistance uh, people um, make in their daily lives. But this particular topic I come to with a sort of personal uh, longevity um, because I was, uh, of course, took inspiration um, and influence from my parents as I grew up, and my dad is a civil engineer who uh, has been doing road and bridge design and repair uh, for 40 years. Uh, so his two favorite mantras that he instilled in me uh, are, one, eat dessert first because you never know what's going to happen during dinner, and secondly, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Uh, but as I grew up and, you know, experienced for myself what uh, transportation and transit especially uh, looks like and uh, learning more about the literature, I found that that form of efficiency really leaves a lot of people out. Um, uh, people's voices aren't heard in terms of their transit needs, uh, and people who uh, particularly are in need of transit uh, are not necessarily reflected uh, in transit planning. And this is really, I think, uh, well shown if we think about gender parity in terms of decision makers. So just looking at this little graphic of um, about transportation decision making, uh, the planning should reflect solutions that benefit all people in communities. Um, but if we think about everybody from graduates of civil engineering, policy making, planning programs, and their instructors, to who occupies the positions in transportation planning and transit authorities, everywhere up to electeds and uh, bureaucrats in local and federal government, uh, we see that those folks are primarily men and they're primarily white men. Uh, and certainly bring uh, forms of expertise to the table, but in any uh, workforce that is less diverse, there is less opportunity to hear different voices and different needs. Um, so there are some transit authorities who've started to address that very transparently. This is from Minneapolis-St. Paul in the States, uh, Metro Transit. Uh, looking at the kinds of diversity that they have in their workforce and specifically in relation to uh, people of color and women in management and employees. Um, and uh, in doing so, trying to make adjustments uh, as they grow and meet the needs of others in the region. So the topics for today, um, we're going to look at sex and gender very briefly and talk about a gender lens. Uh, throughout, actually. We'll talk about uh, intersections of difference because women and men are heterogeneous groups of people. Um, their needs are heterogeneous, and so we have to think uh, broadly about what those needs are. We'll spend a good amount of time talking about what the data shows us, and there are two sort of basic patterns that I want to talk about. One is uh, in differences in terms of travel, travel patterns, 
And secondly, uh, there's a difference in terms of user experience. We'll turn to the demand for data, and really what I, I want to leave you with is uh, a lot of best practices. Um, it, there's really no need to in, reinvent the wheel. Um, there are amazing resources available, uh, widely available online for free, um, and lots of experience uh, that's out there. So um, this doesn't need to be, uh, this is sort of easily, more easily implementable than one might think. And I uh, will ask Frank after the fact to send out a reading list um, so folks can follow up if uh, you would like to. As you see, I have like three webinars at least full of material today. So we will spend um, very little time on each individual slide. Um, and I'm very happy to answer questions after the fact. Um, my email is on the last slide. So you're welcome to contact me with specific questions if we don't get to it. I do want to note before we move ahead why I talked about public transportation in parentheses in the title, and that is um, that the literature is much broader than just public transit. It talks about the gender segregation of uh, bike uh, bicycling, for example. It talks about um, women as the majority of pedestrians. Um, it talks about uh, you know, the few women who are um, in management and frontline staff in terms of cargo transport. So we'll sort of make a nod to a variety of those pieces, but um, the majority of the focus will be on public transit. Okay, so uh, the first thing we want to talk about is equity and equality. Uh, and um, the discussion of transit equity um, is uh, sort of well fleshed out in the literature. Um, I could say a lot about this, um, and from a legal perspective, equality uh, measures are perhaps more um, enforceable, but in a Canadian context, equity is what we're looking for um, in terms of uh, an equitable share of the resources, uh, in terms of networks and services, in terms of uh, trip frequency and quality of trip, in terms of price, um, and that's different than uh, an equal treatment saying, for example, that everyone should have equal uh, sort of um, distance between their house and a transit stop. Um, that may or may not be a possible solution, um, but it is not the solution that is looking at people's specific needs. So um, equity is what we're talking about. Very quickly, uh, Looking at sex and gender, people use these terms synonymously and they are quite different. Uh, so this slide is from the Gendered Innovations uh, set of case studies at Stanford. It's a free resource. It's awesome. I recommend that you check it out. Um, and they provide a couple of examples of how this uh, the, using appropriate language makes a difference in the research. So when we talk about sex, we're talking about biology. Um, they say an engineering study on sex differences in drivers' needs would uh, examine things like automotive design. So many women have the potential to be pregnant, and they should that needs to be taken into account when designing seatbelts. Uh, weight differences, on average, may uh, need to be considered in terms of airbag uh, design. By contrast, a study on gender differences would look at how women and men use vehicles differently because of gender norms and relations. The expectation uh, socially and individually in many cases that women should be doing things like uh, being responsible for childcare. Uh, so these things shape one another um, and uh, it's important to understand the differences between them. So uh, it, it's also important, though, that we need to uh, sort of keep at play attention uh, about uh, both homogenizing this group of women and men um, and also uh, sort of essentializing or making it natural that uh, women are responsible for childcare. Um, so uh, as um, uh, one scholar says, bringing attention to care work emphasizes that this con care work continues to be the central life experience of many women, um, and it's carried out um, because of divisions of labor. Uh, however, 
care work is not only, nor is it necessarily women's work. So we need to really be vigilant about um, the ongoing evolution of gender roles and diversity of situations that both women and men experience. And I often like to talk to my students at uh, Simon Fraser about um, the 2011 uh, Canadian census data, um, which showed that, in fact, gender relations are changing in terms of care work in the household, particularly among people ages 25 to 45. Um, men are taking up more of that kind of uh, caring labor um, you know, doing the laundry, all of those sort of reproductive tasks, um, but it changes when there is uh, there are children present, um, and we can see that on on balance, uh, f women do say 50 hours a week, uh, and men do less than half of that uh, labor. So we have changing gender roles, um, but there are still um, important ways in which these uh, gender norms linger, and uh, unless we have, uh, in some parts of the world, in the Nordic regions, for example, there are policies like use it or lose it paternity leaves. Those are shown to really shift the way that gender uh, roles are change in the household. Um, but until we have that sort of universally, um, these uh, issues need to be sort of kept in mind, and that really, as we will see, shapes women's mobility. This um, brings us to this other point about uh, homogeneity. Women are not a homogenous group, nor are men. Uh, and so in the, in the field, both in scholarship and in municipal social policy, increasingly we talk about gendered lenses needing to be intersectional. And what that means is that we occupy all kinds of different forms of, of social difference, uh, race, class, um, immigrant status, uh, age, for example, over the life course. Um, and so people have a variety of needs. Uh, the graphic here that I've shared is from an old um, bus, dri bus riders union from Vancouver in the early 2000s. And they talk about how uh, workers uh, experience economic hardship, needing late night buses. Um, we're talking about hospital staff, hospital workers, hotel staff, security guards. Those service sector and healthcare industries disproportionately employ women and people of color. Those are low wages and they rely on transit. And so those folks' needs are going to be quite different than the needs of, say, women who are commuting from their house to their workplace uh, in a unidirectional way. So we have to think quite broadly about um, what these uh, diversity of needs are. Okay, so moving into the first uh, key point, the difference that gender makes in terms of travel patterns. Women's trips tend to be shorter and more frequent. Um, they relate to multiple forms and sites of work, so specifically around care labor um, being the ones responsible for uh, caring for children and also uh, seniors and elders, uh, relate to household duties, things like doing grocery shopping, and add up to more time in transit. Um, speaking back cr quickly to the multiple sites of work, uh, we have to think about the way in which the labor market is segregated, segmented. Um, women tend to have uh, more part-time jobs, more quote-unquote flexible labor, and so uh, their time in transit um, and needing to take transit to multiple jobs uh, is an important consideration. In addition, the um, uh, right side of the screen, the graphic from Gender Insight, talks about how many public transport options are not safe or culturally appropriate for women and girls, um, and that's about infrastructure, about uh, sites being poorly lit or not well monitored um, or dominated by male passengers. Uh, and so there are a whole host of ways in which women's mobility is constrained uh, in terms of travel pattern. I'll just go through a few slides on this. Uh, the first is about automobility. So who has licenses? Who is the driver? Um, and we find that 
uh, in a kind of global uh, statistical sense, um, men tend to be drivers, whereas women tend to be passengers. Um, this, uh, in these graphics, um, Table 1, they're both from a UN Habitat report um, published in 2013, S somewhat old data, but um, the author talks about the UK uh, data being quite representative of uh, Western Europe and North America. Um, that uh, women's licensing, the gap between women's and men, men being licensed is um, smaller uh, in sort of uh, midlife uh, and then goes down again uh, after age 50. Um, okay, secondly, uh, getting um, into a discussion of care labor again. Um, Sanchez de Madariaga uh, talks about mobility of care as a really important transformation of the way we collect data about care labor and its relationship to transportation. So um, she uh, advocates for um, moving the data as traditionally collected, as you see on the right side of the screen, uh, shopping and strolling. Um, I, I read that as uh, actually pushing children in strollers for naps, um, uh, visits to uh, elders, for example, moving that all into a care labor category so that we can really visualize um, and make policy adjustments uh, to attend to the kind of care labor that goes on. Another critical element of this is trip chaining, which is about cobbling trips together. Um, it is uh, very instrumental, especially for people who are relying on public transit, um, to be uh, for for us as policymakers to be thinking about how people um, maneuver uh, and what kinds of um, connectivity there is in in transit. Uh, so this is just a um, visualization of a complex trip chain uh, going from your house to drop off your children at daycare to your workplace back on the bus uh, to pick up the children from daycare stop at the grocery store and perhaps walk home um, and we can think that although this particular image is relatively linear uh, it is quite possible for people to be going in multiple directions. So I have heard lots of people talking about uh, in a place like Vancouver where childcare is incredibly expensive and hard to come by, um, people living in one area of the city going in one direction to childcare back on transit to go to their workplace in another section of the city. So they're spending hours of their day uh, in transit. And there was a great piece done in uh, 2010 uh, on the Montreal um, uh, Transit Service about trip chaining, which really just emphasizes this point, that household size um, positively correlates with complex trip chains and for all population segments, but particularly for women. And this translates uh, from 1 0.5% to a 6% 6.5% increase in complex um, in complexity uh, and women uh, ages 35 to 39 really um, bear the brunt of that okay the last piece about um, travel patterns in particular is about accessibility and that is related both to infrastructure so things like uh, step free access to uh, subway stops um, or leaning buses uh, to connectivity. So, um, how uh, how much, how many um, sort of uh, transitions do, do, does one have to make uh, in their transportation um, during the day? Uh, and this piece from uh, York University's um, uh, transit equity reports provide a good quote about that. Um, they say a social service provider says, there are some Ontario Works government assistance clients who aren't able to accept job offer because they have young children and they can't access childcare. Just because a subsidy is available, if it's located in a place where a family doesn't have a car and you have to navigate two buses in order to get to that center, is it truly accessible? Um, and that's a 
really a critical point. Uh, the graphic to the right um, shows some of the literature uh, or an example of the literature that is starting to try to model this around transit equity um, related to catchment areas uh, and trying to um, show where connectivity uh, is lower and this particular study is from Baltimore and Prince George's County so they show that the um, uh, you know, certain parts of the city really benefit from lots of transit and other parts of the city do not, uh, other parts of the region do not, which has a direct impact on people's access to employment opportunities. The second big piece that we want to talk about is user experience. And here again, I just want to remind us that when we talk about this, we talk about safety and perceptions of violence and fear of transit. Um, it's you know possible to make a kind of blanket claim about all women and that's not true um, not all women experience perceptions of fear and some men also experience perceptions of fear but it's also true that statistically uh, women do face uh, more sexual violence and harassment on the street and particularly in relation to transit so uh, women's t trips tend to differ in terms of concerns for safe infrastructure. And some of the literature shows that uh, both women and men have concerns about infrastructure issues like lighting, visibility, um, safety on transit platforms. But those uh, concerns tend to differ. Um, women put uh, emphasis on some things, men put emphasis on others and men tend to be far less concerned about their personal bodily safety. Experiences of sexual harassment and violence is not just about using transit, it's about walking to and from transit and it's about waiting for transit. Uh, so that's a really important element of what our perception of safety is. And uh, as uh, work that's been done on uh, uh, transit um, systems in Japan and in Bogota have shown in particular um, overcrowding and lack of space and the fact that uh, again women are um, you know having kids uh, along with them or um, carrying things makes women more vulnerable to harassment. So there's been lots of um, really great media about this. Uh, the Thomson Reuters report that came out in 2014 generated all kinds of responses around the world um, about uh, what kinds of dangers, uh, what kinds of experiences people face, and uh, interestingly, how uh, bystanders respond to that. So um, Vancouver Transit uh, is a good example of um, trying to be quite proactive in getting um, bystanders to be accountable, to be sort of good citizens uh, through the See Something, Say Something campaign. Um, but you can, you know, sort of do a search and find um, pieces from all around the world. The one that I've listed here is uh, from Thailand from earlier this year. And there are lots and lots of responses to sexualized violence, um, top down, bottom up, uh, and I want to just speak to a couple of them. Um, on the left hand side of the screen you can see the Curitiba's uh, um, bus uh, sort of public awareness campaign um, trying to empower women and trying to sort of point out to men that it is inappropriate to sexually harass. Um, the poster that's listed here says uh, I wore makeup out of the house today that makeup wasn't for you. Um, so trying to be also sort of cheeky in the response. Um, on the bottom left is this is an app called Safety Pin, which is a, an app created um, by a, a collective in India, um, a social enterprise, and they have a couple of different uh, ways in which the app works. One is a safety score for the city, and it's basically using a safety audit, uh, sort of. Um, crowdsource safety audit to talk about which areas of the city are safe and why, uh, and also a, a tracking device, literally, that you can turn on a tracker when you feel unsafe so that other people know where you are. On the right side of the screen are a couple of uh, images from a piece released in The Guardian last week um, from an Instagram feed, and it's um, by a photojournalist who um, wanted to capture uh, women's experiences of street harassment. Um, from my perspective, there are two particularly interesting things. 
one was that at least half of those images came from people who were taking transit or who were waiting for transit. Uh, and the second one was this piece that's highlighted here that the photojournalist um, found that all of her women friends had experienced harassment regularly and all of her male friends were shocked about how frequently women experience this. So we have a lot more education and awareness to do around this and um, it's, uh, I think, great for um, media and uh, sort of creative attention to be drawn to it. It's also important for transit authorities and municipal officials uh, to be um, responsive and proactive. And to speak to this, I want to talk just briefly about a project that a couple of students of mine did a few years ago. Uh, I asked students in a class that I was teaching to create a, a project design uh, about social inclusion in the city and the conversation in the classroom inevitably turned back to transit. Um, so two students uh, created a blog called Harassment on TransLink and I think it was a moment of a perfect storm. Um, it was a moment when there were some sexual assaults both in transit stations and also on the UBC campus. Um, but what that meant was that uh, the blog became immediately populated and got a ton of media attention. Um, among other things, uh, it showed really clearly what people can do in their, um, on a free platform uh, to get conversation going. Um, it uh, sort of spiraled into lots of further conversations. It also got the um, students invited onto a safety council uh, for TransLink. Uh, at least at the time. I'm not sure if they're still um, occupying those positions. Um, and uh, the See Something Say Something campaign that I mentioned earlier, um, that was something that TransLink had been working on, but uh, this um, attention really sort of pushed the hand of the transit authority. So, um, you know, these sort of small projects can have a really uh, big impact. So a few safety-related lessons. Uh, the first on the left-hand side um, is basically forced immobility, that people change their behavior uh, when because of fear around uh, how they move through the city. Uh, so fear is felt by many women, um, and what that has meant is not walking alone, avoiding certain settings, not leaving their houses at all, um, avoiding traveling in the evening, not using public transportation, uh, and so it has incredible behavioral consequences. Uh, looking to the right, um, the um, circle on the right, uh, women are less supportive of technological solutions. Uh, the research that's cited here found that um, while CCTV is a um, quote unquote easy solution, although expensive, um, women are less likely to believe that people are actually watching or that anything will happen um, if they are assaulted and that's captured on screen. So women, uh, whereas men are uh, much more uh, sort of satisfied by the idea of surveillance CCTV as a, as a safety measure. Um, by contrast, women are much more supportive of the presence of staff um, and I know uh, certainly that's a budgetary question. Uh, looking at the bottom, um, night stops are a sort of intervention that really started uh, picking up in the early 1990s. And certainly across Canada, they're basically standard as I understand them now. And just looking uh, in the last few days doing a sort of um, survey, it came up in Winnipeg and Vancouver and Toronto, all kinds of places. Um, and it's not specifically to women. It it's, um, you know, speaks to the safety of all um, populations, but it is an intervention that started because of um, responding to women's safety. The last piece I want to talk about is this um, image on the bottom right, which is the women-only train carriage in Japan. And this is uh, something that uh, in the latest UN Habitat um, has gotten quite a lot of attention. The use of women-only train cars, women-only taxis, uh, and 
uh, there's a lot of sort of debate in the literature, uh, in the popular press about that. Um, on the one hand, it offers people sort of an immediate um, area, um, immediate safety, uh, which is obviously super important. On the other hand, um, it's a Band-Aid that doesn't really address the problem. Um, it puts the onus, as many people talk about, puts the onus on women. Um, and uh, you know, when you when women are traveling with their families, there are all kinds of actually logistical issues around the idea of women taking women-only train cars or um, uh, taxis. So uh, it's an important thing to consider um, from the perspective of folks who I work with. Uh, it is not where we should be investing our money. Okay, so turning quickly then to uh, data. And um, essentially, disaggregated data uh, is really the um, theme of the day. Um, we need to have, uh, we need to record what's going on um, and thus analyze and respond to it. Um, and having um, a sort of blanket uh, discussions that are not broken down by gender or any other social category doesn't help us to understand um, what uh, people's needs actually are, what their situations really look like. So um, many folks talk about uh, complementing um, traditional data on traffic flows and passenger volumes with things like household surveys, time use diaries, transit user surveys, um, and really trying to get at uh, the trips that are not taken, the latent demand. Um, how people are feeling constrained at where they would go if they had the opportunity. And obviously statistics uh, illustrate, but they don't explain what's going on. So, um, and that in combination with the fact that people, that women do underreport sexual assault and violence and fear of, uh, for safety um, means that we need to be more creative than, you know, doing just uh, surveys, uh, so looking at open-ended interviews, focus groups, um, getting people involved in uh, performing uh, gender audits, safety audits of transit systems, of areas around um, transit stops, uh, those kinds of things really offer the opportunity for great data. The Transportation of Associ uh, Association of Canada has started to collect uh, or disaggregate by gender, and this is from their 2016 report, um, where basically they said gender and age in an aging uh, society in Canada um, are really important uh, for forecasting and um, job growth and those kinds of things. So. Uh, they sort of did a baseline uh, that they released in this report. Um, but a gender uh, analysis needs to also keep in mind th the kinds of um, gender lens uh, sensitivities, things like uh, labor market segmentation and that kind of thing. So I just want to point here to um, uh, the graphic I don't expect you to read. It's uh, it, basically tells us that that um, we all use cars um, mostly uh, and like in other parts of the world um, the major cities uh, Montreal Toronto Vancouver uh, and elsewhere uh, women take up more of the transit use less of the cycling um, more of the walking um, but they also talk about uh, the ways in which um, employment uh, is sort of becoming more gender uh, equal. Um, they say the type of occupation is important, which is forms as a proxy for income. Um, and on average, females tended to be employed in lower paying occupations, but the findings um, is, are that females are becoming more equal to males in both number and types of jobs. This is true and it's uh, good data, but it's also the case, as I mentioned before, that women tend to be more of the flexible labor force, uh, occupying, perhaps having the same um, ultimate income, but through multiple jobs. So um, just uh, sort of denoting a category of women is not in, in and of itself sufficient. Um, and we can add 
uh, you know, layers of concern on that. Uh, so how indigenous women, for example, how immigrant women uh, differ in terms of their um, access to employment and need of transit. Um, back to the Metro Transit in Minneapolis-St. Paul and their um, equity statistics. Um, this is a great example of what um, an equity lens can offer, uh, trying to get to areas of concentrated poverty um, and how that poverty is specifically racialized. So um, these statistics show the sections of the city where the more than 40% uh, of riders um, were uh, in coming from areas of concentrated poverty and where at least half of those residents are people of color. Um, and by comparison, uh, Canadian agencies don't have those sorts of formal statistics uh, available at this point. Okay, so finally, what it might look like when it works, what it does look like when it works. Uh, one of the, um, the the thing that one sort of wants to shout from the rooftops after reading this literature is about decision making. Women and diverse communities need to be involved in the design, the planning, the implementation, the monitoring, the evaluation. And uh, one scholar calls this the gender mobility gap that, you know, people sort of, there is an increase in participatory planning uh, and community engagement. Um, but in fact, uh, people are not asked what their experience is um, as much as you might think they should be given how much attention is given in the media. Um, the uh, data collection needs to be disaggregated and uh, ideally um, collaborative and transparent. Um, and I think creative as well. Uh, we don't, we certainly need things like the long form census, but we can also look at um, my community, my health. Uh, we can look at other kinds of um, data that's collected by uh, sort of more creative data, the photojournalist example, um, the various kinds of uh, models that uh, different transit agencies have developed uh, around the world. Um, so data collection can be really um, much broader than just a sort of typical survey. Partnerships are really uh, central to um, building a safer uh, transit and transportation system. And this is, you know, speaks a little bit to reinventing the wheel. There are lots of organizations that are already doing this work. Um, and uh, getting multiple people on board, um, giving them specific responsibilities. Uh, and here I'm thinking of um, the way that uh, the city of Vancouver TransLink um, and the TransLink police, which is you know, a separate part of the organization, um, are uh, looking at um, equity uh, and have the opportunity to look at equity. Uh, the, one of the reports that I'll mention in a second, um, the Safe Cities Report by Women in Cities International has an extensive section on the development of these kinds of partnerships and what kinds of impact they have on um, creating more inclusive cities. And I'm going to just mention a few best practices uh, on the upcoming slides here from a variety of cities. So let me turn to those. Um, Speaking about uh, partnerships and participation, um, as well as accountability, having specific targets that can be monitored and evaluated, uh, Transport for London has done a lot of work around um, using its gender equality strategy for the city, um, building that into a transportation strategy. Uh, and partnering with police and other organizations to spread the costs, spread the work, um, and uh, basically de-silo um, the outcomes. They've had an incredible, uh, over the course of the, this is, uh, a, a lot of this work started at least, I think, in 2004, um, and uh, they've had an incredible number of women, uh, different kinds of women's groups who have participated. 
and what they've uh, come up with are specific design changes, things like step-free access, uh, low bus floors, um, real-time information so that people know um, how quickly uh, transit is, is coming, um, having uh, education awareness campaigns like Safe Travel at Night. Um, just an example of that, uh, this has in London had an impact on accessible streetscapes and step-free interchanges. So um, it's, uh, you know, not, I don't think we can look at the entire city of London and see these changes being made, but this is the strategy that's being implemented as um, streets are being uh, redeveloped and these um, changes, design changes have been implemented um, starting in 2012. Fair structure is a piece that um, is implemented in some areas. Uh, Stockholm is an example of a city that has a free fare for an adult who is uh, with a child in a uh, stroller. Um, so uh, the parents, um, children are not uh, traveling by themselves. Um, and parents have the opportunity to uh, travel for free. Um, and then uh, if they have a, an empty stroller, they have to have a valid ticket. But this uh, speaks to the sort of uh, family friendliness, if you will, of a transit system that expects people, wants people to, to use transit. And then there are a number of um, existing examples of uh, equity lenses and um, safety audits, gender mainstreaming protocols. Um, I don't have it listed here, but Vienna is another um, has another uh, sort of toolkit online. Um, the Asian Development Bank also has a toolkit related specifically to transit. Uh, so this kind of um, not reinventing the wheel, uh, specifically the Safe Cities report goes through many, many, like I think it's about 160 pages long, many, many specific examples of the ways in which transit authorities and municipalities have made adjustments to um, speak to and engage uh, women and diverse uh, voices uh, and build inclusion. The equity and inclusion lens uh, is a um, tool that has been developed with the city of Ottawa by an NGO called City for All Women Initiative, and it's being implemented now in five cities across Canada. Um, I think one of the challenges, I know uh, a bit about this through a different, um, not related to transit, um, and I think one of the challenges is that um, with any kind of municipal policy, there is the possibility for that to become really focused in cultural or social programming um, and not applied uh, more broadly. Uh, so I think, you know, that's a challenge with any um, policy development. But uh, the city of Ottawa is an example of um, trying to address equity um, across its city uh, organization. If you look at no other tools, um, look at this one. Uh, the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions has a fantastic video about sustainable gender equality. Um, and, the f and it's, a, again, a series of case studies, the first one being about snow removal. Um, they look at the way in which uh, the one municipality changed its snow removal practice to focus first on pedestrians um, and sort of uh, access to women-dominated workplaces and daycares, uh, and then last to the, to the main arterials, uh, and found that it uh, served um, a, a greater population, including children who don't drive, um, and saved the... Oh, it, may not have saved the municipality money, but it certainly didn't cost them any more. It was, they talk about it as being cost effective. So it's a fantastic example of um, how these things work in practice. Um, 
if you were so inclined, I think it would be an interesting thing to think about the first mile, last mile problem for transit um, in a kind of practical sense, what we would, how we would understand that through a gender lens. And thinking about what we've talked about, what I've talked about today, um, that first mile, last mile, uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of visibility and lighting, uh, in terms of um, public awareness, um, uh, of safety and perceptions of fear, um, that might uh, help us to do a different kind of design and to get people engaged in thinking about um, how they can be responsive um, transit riders and, and citizens. Finally, in closing, um, I think providing a communi and communicating a safe transit environment that's sensitive to gender difference is essential to women's mobility, and it has so many multiplier effects. It's not just about the woman and her family. It's about opportunities lost in terms of jobs. It's, in ter it's uh, about social integration and a um, you know, immobility, um, not being connected to one's community, and it's about sustainability plans, right? We have all kinds of sustainability plans that want us to see an increase in transit use, a decrease in um, auto use, personal auto use. Uh, if people are not taking transit because they don't feel safe or because their needs aren't being met, we are losing all kinds of um, opportunities there. And the final thing I'll leave you with is uh, that like the night buses, when we make improvements for most, the most vulnerable people, everybody benefits. So if we spend uh, resources in the way that promotes the needs of women and the rights of women uh, and their um, ability to be mobile, we are improving uh, transit and transportation for everyone. Thanks so much. Tiffany, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we're going to dive into a few questions here, and I just thought I would uh, uh, reflect a little bit for a moment on, on the presentation and some, some pieces that jumped out at me. Um, I had to laugh when you were talking about uh, the child care issue of finding child care in a very remote location because that describes my experience exactly. I live just five blocks from where I work, but my child care is located in the next city over. So my five block commute actually takes me an hour and a half uh, uh, in each direction when I actually have to do the child care drop off. But like you described elsewhere in the presentation, I'm also in a family where I'm not the primary child care provider, that's my male partner, and so we have a, a, a different arrangement that, that enables that, but it's also a very tenuous kind of situation, you know, any uh, shift, uh, a, a sick day or, or a difference in, in the, the, the structure of a given day is a really impactful situation. I wondered if you had any reflections on the way that um, transit services or transportation services are designed uh, that might help uh, in a situation like that. Uh, in general, what I see a lot of is a disconnect between the locations of childcare and the locations of work and where people live. Um, and here we, here in the Vancouver context, we have an affordability crisis in terms of childcare that really makes it very difficult to find um, childcare in a in a in, in a location that's both accessible, uh, easy to access, and also affordable. Um, and I wondered if uh, you had reflections on, on how transportation can, can better support a, a, a trip chaining structure uh, that would probably disproportionately affect women. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, I think my answers are um, uh, not, they're not easy answers that I would say I was recently in Stockholm, which is why I came to know about the um, free fare for the person who's uh, bringing the child along. Um, and I was shocked and uh, super happy about that um, realization. Um, I, so I, I do think that uh, caregiver fare structure is something that is an, an important thing to consider. Um, but the other, uh, you know, I'm, I think it's um, asking uh, people, getting more 
you know, the voices into the planning um, that will show us how to make those trip chaining processes more efficient from, you know, bringing the kind of the shortest distance between two points is a straight line sort of efficiency to an efficiency of people's lives. Um, trying to blend those together in a new definition of efficiency. And beyond that, I, all I can think is to say, you know, uh, we have to have leadership who's willing to fund transit and childcare. <laughs> Great. Um, do you have any thoughts specifically about how we can structure um, data collection? Uh, you, you t you've talked about both disaggregated quantitative, presumably, data. Um, do you have any thoughts about how we can better structure that data collection process? What would be the ideal way to gather information to support uh, transportation decisions that uh, would uh, support uh, women in particular um, or the, the gender differences in the way that people travel? Yeah, I think um, certainly it's useful uh, to have um, the renewal of the long-form census hopefully will um, um, provide uh, useful data on that front. I think um, household surveys and um, uh, some of the examples in London, again, um, folks there, there are folks who do that kind of surveying as part of the job of the transit authority, um, going and collecting um, sort of survey data um, while people are in transit, which I think helps in part to the response rate of surveys when people are having to do, you know, uh, longitudinal. Um, I, I have tried to do those studies, right, where you're supposed to um, uh, denote all of the movement throughout your day over a week and do it multiple times. Um, it's very difficult to get a good response rate, um, but getting people um, to collect that data while in transit um, can be one helpful way to do that. I thought about mentioning this during the webinar, but I decided to wait till the questions, I guess. Um, I think uh, the City Studio program through um, in Vancouver, through SFU and a number of other universities, uh, and other um, sort of innovative projects that get students to use their own expertise and develop their own expertise um, could be a really fantastic actual method uh, for kind of cheap data collection. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can speak more to that, but I think um, there are all kinds of communities out there who really care about these issues, but they need to be um, they need to be tapped in creative ways. Great. Um, I'm going to turn for, to a few of the questions uh, from the audience, and I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the questions area of the. Um, the panel on the probably the right side of your screen uh, with all the, uh, the bells and whistles for the webinar program. Um, and I just wanted to turn to one uh, re relating to um, women's or, or people's reports of um, violence and sexual harassment. The question is, in general, have you found or does the literal does the lit suggest that transit authorities com treat complaints of violence and sexual harassment of women on transit in a fair and serious manner? And what can transit authorities do to treat such complaints seriously? Thank you for that question. That's an awesome question. Um, I didn't see a lot of um, discussion in the literature. It's possible that I uh, there's a big literature that I missed. Always, always the possibility. Um, but the um, when transit operators were mentioned, they were often mentioned in relation to violence uh, that they face. Um, so I, I haven't seen a lot um, in in the literature. Um, anecdotally, uh, I've heard a lot of uh, folks talk about um, really great transit. Uh, operators and really not great transit operators and the latter category being in particular on very stressful transit routes like in the Vancouver context the 99 and the 95 uh, those are two 
major uh, university serving lines. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with those, and the 99, I think, still holds uh, as the busiest transit line in North America. Um, I mean, anyone who's been on the 99 at m most times of the day can tell you about being squished. Um, so in those kinds of stressful situations, um, I've heard of folks being uh, having transit operators uh, not respond well to uh, concerns about um, other passengers. Um, I will uh, say um, there was there's one piece that I reviewed for a, a journal. It's not come out yet, but the um, it's based on work that was done uh, by a Portland State student, uh, master's thesis, I believe, um, and it's about trans. Uh, people's experience on transit, so transgender people's experience uh, uh, waiting for and and using transit services. And one of the sites, uh, one of the um, uh, elements that they emphasized was that transit operators played a really important role in um, shutting down aggression and harassment uh, and really advocated in terms of a policy change for more education for uh, transit operators. And I, I think that's true. I also am sensitive to the fact that, you know, those folks have really stressful jobs to begin with to navigate uh, busy cities. So um, I think we have to find uh, a balance there. It's it's funny that you mentioned the the squished 99 experience. It, it's that particular route has um, it, more than 30% of its service hours. The amount of service operated during the day on that particular route is what's called overcrowded. It's by TransLink's definition uh, is over the threshold of of acceptability for the. Uh, overcrowding level during the period in which it's operating, and um, it's it's an interesting tension also between uh, the the desire on the part of most of the cities in the Vancouver region as well as TransLink uh, who have uh, set goals for increasing transit ridership by significant margins. Um, as we want to pack more and more people onto these buses, what impact does that have on people um, who? Uh, need a little bit more room, either because they have a disability or because they need, uh, and or because they need the special seating at the front of the bus. Uh, women who may um, uh, feel safer, located more uh, far forward in the bus, closer to the operator, um, as well as people with strollers. I mean, just yesterday I was on a very packed bus and we passed by two women at different locations who each had a stroller um, and the entire front section of the bus, as well as the back of the bus, was completely full. Um, as we move towards wanting to get more people on transit and wanting to have more efficient transit, I think it will be also um, uh, an interesting um, challenge to try and get uh, a, a system that also supports uh, an inclusion of people that want to take transit. I'm just seeing a question here actually sort of on this topic. Um, do, what are your thoughts on the interior design of public transportation vehicles? Is there any innovation occurring? Um, uh, you know, low floor buses were, were an innovation that, um, you know, uh, in, welcomed more people with mobility issues, including seniors and, and wheelchair users onto transit. Um, are there physical dimensions of transit services that disproportionately affect people of different genders? That's a great question, and I do not know about the design. Um, I am familiar with some comments, uh, again, sort of anecdotally, about accessibility and about um, the beeping of the, um, the move out uh, you know, in the I don't know what that is called, but in the front of the bus when the platform goes out to help people with mobility needs get onto the bus. Mm, the um, ramp, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Easy. Uh, um, that uh, some folks I have um, heard from um, think about that as really um, drawing an unwelcome attention to them. Um, I think even... Uh, 
buses that sort of decline toward the curb make a sound like that. Um, so, I, you know, I think of that as kind of a safety measure um, that I'm not sure we would want to get rid of. Uh, but I am aware of people's sensitivities around um, sort of being uh, more, even more sort of hyper visible than than they already are. Um, I, one thing I will say, uh, just again, thinking about students and how they respond to the, the See Something, Say Something campaign, and in Vancouver there is the yellow strip uh, in the train cars, in the subway, um, for people to sort of silently alert uh, transit police authorities that something untoward is going on, um, and do so in a way that uh, helps bystanders to keep themselves safe. Um, I, I've heard a sort of uneven um, responses about that, like some people just don't even know that it exists. So I think, uh, I know TransLink has put a lot of work into alerting people to that, but even more education is necessary. Um, but I do think that people, uh, the people that I've heard from have um, felt somewhat more secure in in its ability to be um, uh, not noticed when you're um, pressing that. Uh, I had thought of one other thing. Oh, it just it, it's not a design issue; it's a um, frequency issue. So um, when you have uh, you know. A routes like the number 20 in Vancouver, like the number 99, sorry, I think of the number 20 as one that um, uh, a lot of folks with mobility issues take, um, and the 99 being just a really heavily occupied bus. Um, it's okay to have uh, the design that it has if there were more buses, right? So um, if you get passed by, knowing that one is coming up in five minutes is a different thing than waiting for another 20 or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel you there. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> we, we do struggle uh, to some degree, I think, in this region with the success of some particular routes. Um, uh, which uh, some of the most successful routes in the region, uh, by some definitions, are also uh, difficult to use if you're if you're a user who needs uh, a greater amount of space to feel comfortable or to uh, navigate your wheelchair or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking through here, questions. Uh, uh, we've got another one here um, about city or municipal policies. Uh, in, to ensure that transportation planning policies are systematically checked with regards to gender equality. Maybe to make that a bit more general, um, are you uh, familiar with any cities that have done really uh, particularly great work with re in relation to um, uh, making sure that transportation planning is reflective of uh, and inclusive of, of women and, and uh, gendered issues. Um, you had raised a couple of examples in, in your presentation. Have you um, personally experienced any uh, uh, other locations that are of interest? Yeah, I think, you know, not to sort of harp on London, um, and I'm sure that London has its problems, um, not least of which is the affordability of transit in London, um, but th there is quite a lot of emphasis uh, on the work that Transport for London has done with women um, and sort of demanding uh, gender uh, equity um, as part of uh, transport uh, strategic planning. Um, I think Vienna is another great example of um, of a city that has um, really tried to do gender mainstreaming across the board, um, and they uh, have um, yeah lots of good case studies to point to the results of that. Um, I'm trying to think of the other examples that were in the Swedish video. I've seen it about a thousand times now. I, I should know them immediately. Well, they talk about night buses as well. Um, so basically, in a in an EU setting, um, there's a text called Fair Fair Shared Cities um, that uh, talks about some of these examples um, and the way in which gender mainstreaming has been used um, to shift municipal policy and to 
um, sort of demand that a gender lens is placed on everything from you know social inclusion to the city budget. Um, that said, I will I will say also that uh, gender mainstreaming is critiqued um, for uh, sort of being a you know a check um, something that people check off. Um, so it's important always to remain vigilant about um, how that's actually informing um, monitoring and, and change of policy. Um, thanks. Um, I, in relation to, um, I'm seeing some questions about some other topics and I think we'll shift gears a little bit. I wonder if Frank could also chime in on how much time we have left. Um, while we wait for that, uh, I just want to read out one of these questions. Uh, the question is, for urban design, it seems that bike lanes give priority to a small group of people while restricting traffic flow for public transit. Isn't this counterproductive considering that people wouldn't be riding bikes for caregiving, trip chaining activities? Which is an interesting question, actually, because um, for some of the trips that uh, my partner does uh, to and from childcare and work, those are actually bike-based trips. So mm -hmm. um, I, I see both sides of the question, and as a public transit planner, I also have the lens of um, the first mile and last mile that Tiffany uh, was mentioning, that everybody who uses transit is also somebody who needs to get access to transit, and bike is one of the ways of doing that. Um, that in mind, it is also very difficult to carry more than one child on a bicycle that will also fit on a bike rack. Um, so some of the, one of the, the dimensions of that is uh, probably provision of better, safer bike rooms, especially for the kind of uh, more expensive form factor of bicycle that's required to carry more than one child. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on uh, where the literature is or where the practice is in terms of um, supporting both bicycle trips and transit trips, or is there a tension between them? Um, I, I think where the literature shows that women tend to use bicycles uh, less than men, um, where it, the gap is the narrowest uh, is in the places that you would expect them to be the narrowest, places like Denmark, um, and places that have uh, separated bike lanes that are um, separated by actual curbs as opposed to painted lines on the road. So again, um, I think pointing to this point about um, when you make uh, infrastructure and policy change for the most vulnerable, you actually serve everybody. Um, when you people say that when you uh, make biking infrastructure for um, children and elderly people, um, more people are able to use it as well. Um, so I think uh, that is um, one point of the of the puzzle. Um, the other that comes to mind is that I'm, I heard a, I think he was a transit planner, I can't recall offhand, but somebody who works in Chicago a few years ago talking about how Chicago uh, wants to compete with Portland for being the best cycling city in the US. And he talked about um, the way that the city uh, um, infrastructure uh, folks, I'm losing <laughs> uh, language here, um, the way that they're addressing that is, you know, every time they do uh, um, a change to uh, curbs or um, any kind of upgrading, they incorporate bike lanes into that change. Uh, so that becomes part of their larger strategic plan. Um, and yeah, go ahead. We have a very, I think, a very similar approach here at the city of Vancouver where um, upgrades to cycling and walking infrastructure are um, done both uh, in, a, uh, in a forward thinking way but also in an opportunistic way as redevelopment it takes place here in the city, um, which is happening at an, a staggering rate. Uh, space for AAA cycling facilities, that's um, all ages and abilities. Uh, and genders uh, is is um, the goal is to find space for those accommodations as well um, on the premise that uh, people are more attracted to cycle 
particularly in facilities that are more spacious, more protected from other automobile traffic, and uh, where, uh, uh, in particular, I think women are more sensitive to uh, the, the perception of safety in, in those kinds of environments. And so the all ages and abilities philosophy is um, intended to build a, a, a network, a connected network, where people can uh, not only use uh, individual streets to, to cycle, but um, the idea is to build a, a connected network one piece at a time. Um, it's very expensive to do that and very, very costly. It would be astronomical to just uh, do it on a wide, widespread basis. And so um, part of the answer is to do it, um, you know, to build a network as it, in a piecemeal kind of way um, as the opportunity arises through redevelopment. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask also about uh, uh, an age dimension of women. Uh, uh, people experience different components of, or, or different structures in their lives uh, throughout uh, their lives. Um, in, for example, uh, in, a, in a university sort of setting, in a school-based setting, uh, during youth, um, in a working environment, in young years, um, child rearing and bearing years, um, uh, then there's retirement and aging. And I wonder if you have any perspectives on how transportation uh, planning processes can differently or better serve women and people at different stages of life. Um, one of the questions here is, um, uh, or comments is, m wanting more attention brought to senior women issues, including safety, bathrooms, length of waits for buses, um, in, in surveys is the question. Um, uh, and is there uh, a way to, to draw out the differences in uh, women's ages? Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have anything to add to that comment. I think it's absolutely critical. Um, and it, the only way to get to that is to have a diversity of voices at the table. Um, and, you know, uh, thinking about some of the experiences I had in, uh, I did a policy degree before my PhD and um, worked with some folks who were working with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Um, one of the uh, experiences was having, you know, you have the opportunity to do sort of participatory planning or comment on the design, but on the two options that the design, the folks at the Department of Transportation brought to the table. Uh, and I think people need to be, you know, users need to be a part of that process before those designs are brought to the table. That is what will help to make users' needs actually be met. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, on, uh, on another safety topic, um, one of the questions relates to the Compass card, which is the Vancouver region's TAP card. Uh, we, uh, in this region, it was, I guess, about a year, year and a half ago now that we uh, reached uh, implementation of the Compass Card program, uh, which enables people to pay using a, a contactless uh, uh, card-based system uh, where you can board a, a bus or a SkyTrain or the C-Bus um, or the West Coast Express commuter rail service um, using a card-based system. Uh, the question relates to data privacy and information privacy, particularly as it relates to women. Um, and uh, the comment is that the implementation of Compass Cards raised concerns for women's safety from women, um, from women's groups. And um, the example given was um, battered women's support services raised concerns about how tracking data with Compass Cards could be a tool for abusers to track people's movements and track people back to transition houses, for example, um, as anyone could register the cards without another's knowledge or to control someone's registration. Um, this is similar to people's concerns about data tracking and privacy, but it's specific to women's safety. Um, do you have any particular thoughts on that? Wow, that's a, I, again, I'm just repeating myself, but that kind of concern would never come to the table without uh, folks from BWSS being a part of that conversation. Um, it's funny, I, I, I um, in the transit, uh, sort of the world of literature on women and gender in transit, Gen sex and gender disaggregated data is like the gold standard, um, and there is much less 
uh, discussion of uh, privacy. Um, and it is difficult, I know from the city's perspective, from municipal governments in Canada, to, it's difficult to collect gender desegregated data because of provincial and federal privacy laws. Um, so it, it is certainly a consideration. Um, and I would say that BWSS and uh, similar organizations need to be a part of that conversation to figure out what um, what kind of meeting ground there can be so that we have data to show how people are how people are needing to use transit without sacrificing their personal safety great um, with relation to, um, I, I wondered if I could turn to uh, sort of a speculative question um, where the, the buzz at the moment is all about uh, automated, connected, future vehicles that are driverless. Um, have you speculated at all about the future of the driverless car, about the future of driverless transit and the impact on um, uh, gendered roles and gendered lives uh, that that would have? Um, uh, I have thought that um, my, my neighbors uh, shuttle their uh, older child to baseball constantly and it's in places like Langley which is a very far suburb. It's, they shuttle him around all over the region on a daily basis and wouldn't it be nice to just put, uh, put one's kid in a car uh, send it off and uh, have uh, the escort, uh, the, 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 the coach or whatever, unlock the AV at the other end and um, escort the kid to these activities. Have you given any thought to um, any sort of wild speculative ideas about how the, um, the, the AV future might uh, impact women uh, differently? Uh, that's a great question. It just makes me laugh, actually. <laughs> um, I, I, so I have two thoughts on that, um, speculative responses. One is about the advent of the washing machine <laughs> and like the advent of any household appliance that uh, is supposed to help women uh, sort of lighten their burden. Um, and the while I really appreciate washing machines and I don't want to, you know, use a washboard, I'm also aware that um, they create an expectation that you can just continue to do more and more and more and it never really uh, questions who is doing these things, right? Um, so the gendered component, uh, which I think is not really part of the conversation about hot automation so much, um, there's a the, and that leads to the second point, which is there's a fantastic organization based in California uh, called Transform, um, capital T, trans, and then form, capital F. Uh, and they do a ton of work on um, environmental sustainability from an equity perspective. So how we can combine the need to be um, environmentally sustainable and conscious uh, and meeting the needs of the most vulnerable. And some of their reports talk about the um, sort of great uh, innovations in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, in Oakland in particular, uh, where a lot of disadvantaged communities live, um, uh, bike shares, car shares, those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, their reports show that these um, sites are disproportionately located in places that are incredibly high income levels, which translates into pretty white communities. Um, and so I guess I would just say that um, the speculation needs to have an equity and gender lens as a part of that conversation. Great. Um, I think um, we've, I'm just getting a message from Frank that we have run out of time um, and we've had an amazing set of questions and a fantastic talk. Uh, Tiffany, I want to thank you for your presentation and for sharing your uh, experience and your work uh, around the world and, and, um, and in this topic. Um, and um, I think uh, it's been a great discussion and uh, I've learned quite a bit about uh, some of the dimensions that are particular to public transit but also to other modes as well. Um, and it's been a great discussion. Thanks so much, Tara and Frank. <laughs>